Hi, this is Martin Fowler, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising. Another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I am your host today, Troy Lifewood. I am the sole host today. Today we have a very special episode uh, where I am going to just present a topic with some follow along visuals. Now you don't need to bring up the visuals to listen, to, to, to participate, but if you do bring up the visuals, I think you may get more out of it. So I am going to be putting some links in the, in the show notes. Uh, and I'll refer to those links uh, when it's appropriate. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, the number one thing that's killing your delivery. Uh, I know that's a little bit of a clickbaity headline, but you know what? In this day and age, that's just the norm, right? So, um, and I will say it is agnostic of framework of technology. It's totally agnostic of everything. You know, it's time to end the pissing wars. It's time to end the framework versus framework versus um, manager versus scrum master, all this nonsense is just say what helps us deliver and what prevents us from delivering. And what do we mean by deliver, right? Um, a lot of people focus on the amount of stuff that somebody can do or teams can do, right? Uh, worse, worse would be the amount of stuff, right? That an individual can do, but the amount of stuff, uh, that even a team can do is not necessarily the best focus. What should, and the reason for that is because we could be doing a lot of stuff, but we could be doing very poor quality and we can do a lot of stuff very quickly, but then we incur a, a bunch of debt. And we'll be talking about that today um, in the terms of technical debt and, of course, the main topic today, which is flow debt. Um, so really, when I say delivery, I'm talking about the ability to consistently deliver in a predictable manner um, with fast cycle times. So I'm saying it's not just enough to have fast cycle times, but can we have a fast cycle time or fast cycle times in a consistent manner, which helps us accurately forecast within a very small range? That's that's the focus of today. Um, so it's doing those fast cycle times over and over and over again, and not having some things have a fast cycle time and then have some things have a very long cycle time. For the purposes of today, I'm not going to use the term lead time. I'm just only going to use the word cycle time. And what I mean by that uh, is the time something, uh, the time it takes for something to finish once it started, right? So really just the elapsed calendar days from the time it starts in your process, whatever you consider your starting point, till it ends in your process. So when I say cycle time, that's all I mean. So you can take that from when it hits the backlog to when it's in production or when it's in uh, development to when it meets the definition of done. Whatever you want to consider your start and end points, we're just going to call it cycle time. So I have some visuals to show you. Um, I have a cycle time scatter plot. I have um, a, a different chart I'm going to show you which correlates with that. Um, so let's get started. So the number one thing killing your delivery, again, agnostic of technology, agnostic of framework, it really doesn't matter, um, is something called flow debt. And it's not something that I hear many people talk about. In fact, um, a lot of trainings I've been to in my past, um, Agile-related trainings, and I, I'm going to kind of leave out the frameworks and those things for now, um, or for the rest of the talk, actually. Um, a lot of trainings I've been to talk about practices which actually, if you follow those practices, you would be incurring flow debt. You'd be actively incurring it. And it would kill your predictability and your ability to deliver over time and the ability to forecast accurately. So we're not going to do those things. And some of those things, which I'm right away, I'm going to say, don't do, they're evil. Uh, using the word evil as a joke, but I, I'm half joking. Um, number one is don't use an expedited lane. We'll talk a little bit today about what you can do instead, but don't you do it. Number two is definitely don't create classes of service. Um, that is a big no-no. Of course, you could do any of these things, but hopefully I'm going to convince you today that it is a horrible, terrible idea. It's a terrible practice, and it's one of the things that kills delivery. Now, let's say that you don't use terms like classes of service or expedite lanes, which are 
traditional quote unquote uh, Kanban things to do. I'm going to suggest that every single day that you or your team or the teams that you're working with make decisions which actively incur flow debt, which you're treating things like a class of service, although you don't necessarily call it that. Um, so we're going to be going through some examples of that today. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is look at the first picture uh, labeled cycle time scatter plot in the show notes. If, uh, again, if you're not looking right now, that's totally fine. I'll just kind of walk you through what I'm, what I'm showing. Um, so right now we're looking at a cycle time scatter plot for a team. Um, this is an agile team. Again, I am going to be agnostic of the framework or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so the way you would read this chart is on the y-axis, you have the elapsed time that these items took to complete um, in days. And on the x-axis, you have on which day that they were completed, right? So we're only looking at the past, basically. It's kind of like looking at a looking up in the sky at night, right? What we're looking at is basically the past. Things that have happened in the past, the stars, that light is coming from a long time ago, potentially. And essentially, that's what a cycle time scatter plot is. At least that's the way I think about it. It may be cheesy, but that's how you could remember it. So, um, okay, so what do you notice about this chart, right? Well, I'll just give you my thoughts. Number one, uh, in many of these, these are user stories we're looking at, by the way. Many of the user stories are actually delivered fairly quickly for this team, right? You can see there are a handful of user stories that even have a cycle time of two and three days on this chart, right? You may also see other user stories that take 15, 16, uh, 22 days to deliver. And there's a few outliers, right? Of course. Um, so the first thing to think about is these percentile lines here on the chart. Um, <clears throat> the way you would read them is whatever percentage the total number of stories or items that you're looking at here, 85% of them, I'll just use that for example, 85% of them fall within that range, meaning in this specific chart, 85% of all the stories this team has finished in this time period are done or were completed in 15 days or less. So that is the range, right? It's not an average, it's just saying hey, 85% of the work is done in 15 days or less, right? That is the range. So 95% are done in 20 days or less. 70% um, uh, are done in 10, 10 days or less. We have an 85% probability, if we were to start a new story tomorrow, that it could be done in 15 days or less based off of this chart, basically. That's how you could read this. And you notice that this is agnostic of size here. Um, so that's how, that's how this chart reads. Okay. So let's talk about um, what I'm noticing on this chart and I'll walk you through it. So there are many stories which have this two to kind of five day cycle time. There are also many stories which have this 12 to 18 day cycle time. And then a few kind of outliers above the, the, uh, the 20 day cycle time. Now, let's say that this was a scrum team, which it very well may be. Again, it doesn't really matter, but let's say it was a scrum team. Uh, this is pretty common, uh, a scrum team type of chart where their 85th percentile will be over a two week sprint. So, um, and you would see a pattern of them not completing sprint goals or rolling over work into future sprints, right? That's a very common pattern, which we see in, in, uh, in scrum. So, so for a scrum team, right, you would say, Hey, we would want our 85th percentile not to be 15 days, right? You'd probably want it to be something less, right? And you, you may suggest that, hey, it, maybe it should be 13 days, right? That's within that two week. And so, but even if it was 13 days, there's going to be 15% of the, of the work that's over that, right? So that's probably not a good goal to shoot for. But then it's also assuming that the team is going to start all of the work day one of the sprint, which is a pattern that you probably wouldn't want it to follow um, because your work in progress will be very high at that point. Um, and but there is a correlation between work in progress and cycle time. So what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting really for even something like a scrum team, you'd want your 85th percentile to be within a week or less, right? Well, that's, that's the goal in order to have successful sprints at scrum. Regardless of scrum though, if you want to have fast, consistent cycle times, you need to bring those 85th percentiles, 95th percentile numbers down. Um, and so the way that would visibly look on a chart, it would look like these uh, dots basically squish down inside of that range, right? And so one of the key lessons kind of here is that I'm trying to get across today is that cycle time is really a picture. It's not a single number. 
Uh, a lot of people will use an average and they will track their performance based off of an average. There's a few problems with that. Number one is averages are heavily um, weighted by the outliers, right? And sometimes in life, there's going to be outliers. There's going to be the cases where something went horribly wrong and there was absolutely nothing we could do about it. And in that case, I don't really want those kind of rare, rare things to be involved uh, in any kind of metric which has to do with our normal day-to-day -day process. So that's number one. And so using percentiles it, it, uh, fixes that problem. Number two is my average cycle time was, you know, eight days, right? And tomorrow uh, we, we deliver something in 10 days. Is that better or worse, right? Well, half the time it's going to be it's going to be over eight days anyway, right? And half the time it's going to be under eight days, right? So it's not a very useful metric. It doesn't, uh, it's not, or, or a useful piece of information really. And it shouldn't be a performance metric because it doesn't give any information about whether the variability around that cycle time is normal or not. So that being said, what is applicable, right? Well, if we can get our percentile lines down, we would have to consistently deliver under that, not just one-offs, right? Not just sometimes we're at two, sometimes we're at 20. In order for that for that picture, that picture would look like a squished number below that 15 days where consistently we'd be delivering under that 15 days, probably under 10 days, right? Depending on what we want to get to. So you would decide, you know, personally with your teams and your organization, what kind of goal you would want to set with your percentile lines. But basically really what it is, is you can expect that when we start working on something, here is the probability of how long it would take in the range, right? So um, I've talked a lot about the cycle time scatter plot here. So what is the number one thing, right? So sorry about that if, I, if I'm going way too far into the chart. Um, the number one thing I, I mentioned is flow debt. So let's just look at this particular chart, okay? Again, it actually doesn't look terrible. It looks better than a lot of cycle time scatter plots you'd look at to be fair to this team, okay? Uh, but really, I'm, gonna, I'm suggesting that this isn't really good enough. And the reason why it's not good enough, even um, good enough in quotes, right? Maybe for this team it is, but I can tell you in the context of Scrum or in a context of somebody claiming that they're doing Kanban because they want to have this kind of consistent fast delivery where and they can deliver any time, right? A 15-day 85th percentile is, is, for most teams, is not what they'd want it, where they want to be, right? So in order to do that, we really have to reduce our variability of the cycle times. So the number one killer of variability is how we prioritize work every day, meaning not prioritize it once it's when it's in the backlog, but how we prioritize what to work on and when on a daily basis. Those decisions, what we're not really thinking about it, um, probably in that manner that we're prioritizing it once it's already been prioritized because we're thinking, oh, we prioritized it by value or by cost of delay or by, you know, somebody needs something today or things like that. Uh, but so we don't, we don't think in terms of prioritization, but what you choose to work on today versus other things, when and why, that is a way of prioritizing it, whether we call it that or not, right? One common thing was, well, we prioritized it by some technique in the backlog, right? So we should just treat the priority of an item once it's on the board with the same priority. And what I'm suggesting is that is a mistake. And so let's walk through an example. So we're going to move off of the cycle time scatter plot now. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to a website for an amusement park. That amusement park is Six Flags Great Adventure. I just chose it because it's the one near me. It's the one I grew up going to. Uh, I live in New Jersey and it is a Six Flags in New Jersey. So I'm going to show you uh, a couple things here. The first link we're going to look at is called King the Ka. So this is a very famous roller coaster at Six Flags. Uh, and this roller coaster is one of, if not the tallest, but one of the tallest in the, in, in the world, actually. It's up there, at least. At least it used to be, I think, at one point. Anyway, I've been excited to ride this ride. So I'm going to walk you through the experience of waiting for a roller coaster uh, great adventure. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna wait, wait in line. So I want you to take a look at this picture. If you're not looking at it, that's totally fine. It's just a giant, basically U shape in the sky. Um, <clears throat> I want to now take you to the tickets and passes link. Okay, so follow me to that link here. Now what we're looking at are passes. So because it's not in season, you're not seeing um, a single ticket because it they're not available. 
but what you could uh, purchase is passes. So if you bought a ticket, so let's say the morning of, you say, you know, I'm gonna go, I wanna go online or I'm gonna wait in line and I'm gonna buy a ticket, right? That ticket might be 60 or 70 bucks or something like that. I don't know exactly what it costs anymore. And then you have to pay 20 or $30 for parking. So just to show up and enter the park, it's going to be probably around $100 most likely, give or take. And that doesn't include food and all that, right? Per person. So it is not cheap. Uh, and so, but it is a full day of fun potentially you get, right? So now you've paid your $100, you've paid your $100 for your spouse, your kids, whatever, your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And now you've spent hundreds of dollars potentially to go to this amusement park. And you're really excited to ride King de Ka. Okay, so you go, you're waiting in line, and the line says, hey, from this point forward, it's going to be a 90 minute wait. Now you're thinking to yourself, hey, I have eight hours today, right, to spend at this park. Maybe that's your time you budgeted. Uh, I'm, am I going to spend 90 minutes waiting for one single ride that's going to last about 20 seconds? Um, but yeah, probably if that's the ride you want to ride, right? So you notice um, on the there's a sign that talks about these passes, right? And it says, hey, if you want to buy these passes, go online and you can purchase a pass right now or you can come to customer service and we'll sell you a pass. Now, what do these passes do? These passes allow you to essentially cut the line. It allows you to cut your wait time. Okay. So essentially what Six Flags is doing is they are monetizing the frustration. So they're basically frustrating you as a customer by waiting, making you wait 90 minutes. And they've, you've already paid them for that frustration, by the way. And now that you're sitting in that line, they're saying, oh, well, if you don't want to wait 90 minutes, you can certainly pay us another $100 or $150, and you don't have to wait in line with the rest of the suckers. You can just go right in the front, okay? So now you're saying, you know what? I've already paid hundreds of dollars. I, I don't really want to pay another $150 for the diamond pass and then cut in front of everyone right in the line because now it's not just 150 for me, it's everybody else in line that I go with. So now we're talking about literally spending over $1,000 for a few people to go to a amusement park for a day, for eight hours. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So you wait in line, right? And you're not really noticing any issues waiting in line, but you're noticing it's taking longer than 90 minutes, but you're not really thinking about it because you can't even see what's happening at the front of the line. Okay, you get to the sign that says, from this point forward, it's going to take 30 minutes. The expected wait time from this point forward is 30 minutes. Okay, but now you can see the front of the line and you notice that there are people cutting in front of you. Not directly in front of you, but they're cutting in front of the very uh, front of the line. And you're like, wait a minute. Are these people the ones that paid for this diamond pass, right? Did all these people really pay an extra $150 per person? Uh, yeah, but the answer is yes, they did. Uh, so you are sitting there. So now they get to go. It takes them, the maximum wait time for them is five minutes because they've cut to the front of the line. Now your, th your expectation of 30 minutes, what has happened to that 30 minutes? Think about it. They've borrowed five minutes, basically. Like they've cut in front of you. Now they had to wait five minutes. You're still standing in the same exact spot. After five minutes, you haven't moved. What has happened to that 30 minute forecast? It's now 35 minutes. Okay, now you go forward a little bit. Now you're waiting. Okay, I move forward a little bit. Another five people cut in line, another 10 people, another two people, it doesn't matter. They also waited five minutes. Now you're still standing in the same spot. Every time that happens, if you think about it from a cycle time scatter plot perspective, their cycle times are going to be two to five minutes, right? And so if you were looking at a cycle time scatter plot of this King to Car ride, you may see some riders get there two to five minutes. Other riders, right, are 30, 60, 90, 120 minutes. And every single time someone cuts in front of the line, they essentially are borrowing your forecasted time because they're telling you it's going to take 30 minutes from this right. Now you're thinking, by the way, it's a faulty thinking, but this is the way we think about it, that when they say 30 minutes, you're not thinking of the probability of it being 30 minutes. You're thinking, oh, it says 30 minutes, so therefore you think that it's actually going to be 30 minutes. But that's not actually what's happening. On the back end, there is a probability, well, I'm sure that they probably have figured this out, of what that 30 minute forecast is. Regardless though, as a human, you're thinking about, hey, 
This is a deterministic forecast. Hey, I think it's going to take 30 minutes or an estimate, right, quote unquote. That is fair enough. And it may take 30 minutes as long as people don't keep cutting in front of you. As if, they, if they didn't control how many people can cut in front of you, theoretically, it could be an eternity, right? <laughs> that you wait, it, doesn't, it won't be 30 minutes anymore. So I'm sure they have ways of controlling that. They probably have like a, a reservation system, I know, for these passes a lot of times where you have to reserve what time you want to go. And that's how they're probably able to control this concept of flow debt. So what do I mean by flow debt? Flow debt is simply borrowing cycle time from one item to pay it back to another. Every time you do that, you increase your variability. And by its own nature, by, if you look at that cycle time scatter plot, you're going to increase the distance of the cycle times on the cycle time scatter plot, which will also increase your percentiles, right? So your, your cycle time percentile. So let's say that you had an 85th percentile of 13 days or less. That means that if you bring an item, you can say with an 85% certainty that you can do it in 13 days or less. Really, that's how you read that. The more that you incur flow debt, the more variability you have, the more things start to go over that 85th percentile because you keep borrowing time from some items and giving it to another. Your 85th percentile or 95th or whatever percentile you're looking at or you care about, that's actually going to increase. So flow debt not only um, makes you less predictable because what it does is it increases your variability. Your range is going to increase and not get better. And the fact that your range is increasing means that your forecasts are less accurate and less useful. So now the higher your range is for, your, uh, for a percentile, the more worthless your forecast is, right? That's why it's very valuable to have a tight range of a cycle time for any item that you bring in, right? So what's better? If I can say with an 85% certainty that when I, when I start working on an item or when my team starts working on an item, we can do it in five days or less, right? Versus 15 days or less. If someone is expecting something, if we're trying to plan something, right? Which range is better? Now, obviously the number itself is better, right? Five is better than 13, but it's not so much about the number as it is what that picture looks like in between five and 15. Because now it's like, hey, it could be done in one day, could be done in 14 days, could be done in 15 days, right? It's like, well, that's not very useful. Sometimes it could be done in two days. Sometimes, hey, I want to know from a predictability standpoint, when you say five days, I want to be certain, right? Now, there's no such thing as certainty, right? But certain within a, a probability of how long it's actually going to take. And so focusing on reducing your variability is critical. So concepts like classes of service, expedite lanes, prioritizing based off of what we originally prioritized the item for, once it's started, treat every single item the same unless you have a very exceptional reason not to. And define those exceptions up front as part of, um, part of your definition of workflow. Creating a, creating a working agreement. Everything gets treated the same once the cycle time starts, unless it meets a very extreme criteria, right? Of course, there might be always extremes, like production is down, you gotta fix it today. Fair enough, right? We don't, need a, we don't need a physical lane to do that, right? We, don't, we can certainly just as a, a team agree to focus on finishing that thing today. But if it doesn't meet an extreme criteria like that, now you, every context is different, right? You define extreme. But it's certainly not because so-and-so wants to put something through an expedited lane or so-and-so wants a special class of service, right? That is going to totally kill your predictability and your forecast and your ability to deliver consistently and with fast cycle times and a consistent basis, right? And it's going to kill your ability to forecast for any meaningful effect, right? So that's my number one tip is do not actively incur flow debt. So how do we avoid that, right? There are two, two to three, I would say, depending on how you're doing the math here, um, main things to focus on. So some people would say, hey, maybe we should focus on putting whip limits, right? That people will start with whip limits. I'm going to suggest that don't start with whip limits. There's nothing wrong with whip limits, right? They're, they're fine. Um, but whip limits, you should tweak later if you use them. You don't need to use whip limits to actively control your work in progress. The best way to get started, in my opinion, is to focus on item age. Item age is the number one most important metric you can possibly use for a predictable delivery system. If you want to be able to deliver fast, 
predictably, you want to have really great forecasts, you want to be able to help you with your marketing, with your releasing of things, be able to act more accurately predict when you can do things, then you'd want to focus on getting a predictable, fast system, right? Whatever that, whatever that means for you. So number one, focus on work item age. And what do I mean by that? I mean the elapsed time something has started but not yet finished. So create a policy on your board, right, for your board, that says, hey, once something has started, every single thing gets treated with equal priority and we will prioritize the item age first, okay? That doesn't always mean that you prioritize the oldest item. You, know, you may say, Troy, what do you mean by that? Um, so I'm gonna show you another picture. If you go to the picture that says aging work in progress chart, okay? The aging work in progress chart is a chart that you can use. And you don't have to use this chart, this tool, or anything like that. But the aging work in progress chart um, is a visual representation of the item age of things in your process. So on the y-axis are the days that it's been in progress. On the x-axis are the columns in your workflow. It's pretty simple, right? I'm not going to explain the whole chart. But basically what I want you to know is it focuses on the item age over anything else, right? So I can visually see how long things, how old things are. I can see how long they've been started, right, but not yet finished. And I can see where they're at in the process. So every day I can say, hey, for example, in this picture, I have five items. So you can see one, there's a four there and then there's uh, just a regular dot. I have five items over my 85th percentile, right? So basically, today I'm going to focus on getting those things out the door um, because I know that the higher, the longer things I let sit, the longer that they age, the more variability I'm going to have, right? You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Those things could get blocked. Uh, a global pandemic could happen, right? Production could go down. Anything could prevent you from finishing those items tomorrow, right? So the, the longer you let them delay and you will start to see your cycle time scatter plot, that picture of your cycle time is going to be all over the place, which will actually increase your percentile line. So that's not what you want to do, right? So focus on item age. So it's easy to focus like the things on the right of the board, which things are older, et cetera. Now I want you to imagine the item, the things that have the oldest item age are actually in that analysis active or analysis done column. And so the things in this testing column here, let's say they were seven to eight days old and the things in analysis done, let's say they were 14 days old, which ones are more important to focus on today? And in that case, it really gets you to think about, you know, this is mantra, right? Stop starting, start finishing, this whole kind of mantra. So we've been kind of programmed to always walk the board right to left. And what I'm suggesting is that is not always the best case. Doesn't, of course, you can look at it right to left, but we should be really focusing on the relationship between item age versus the expectation that we have about how long things should take to complete. And that expectation is in the form of that percentile or an SLE as we call it, right? So in this picture, the expectation would be 15 days or less if that's what we wanted to, to be doing. Let's just assume that that's the expectation that we want, it's 15 days or less. So therefore, if something is in, in analysis done and it's 14 days, right? The probability that it's going to be done within 15 days or less is obviously very low. Does that mean that we should just stop working on it? No, that means we should prioritize it more. Because the longer it ages, and the more we work on other things in front of that, essentially, if we work on things that have less of an item age, we are incurring flow debt. We're basically borrowing one item cycle time. We're borrowing the thing in analysis done to give it to the one in testing that has it, because we might be able to get, quote unquote, a faster cycle time for the testing one, because it's only been seven or eight days, right? And then essentially what we're doing is we're going to have to pay it back to the one sitting in analysis done later. And that's going to just increase your variability. You can think about how often in your life that you said, oh, which one do we work on today? Well, it's the one that has the highest priority item. That's the one we choose. Every time we do that, we incur flow debt um, if we don't focus by item age. Or, hey, it's because so-and-so uh, is working on this item and we have nobody to work on this item, right? Nobody meaning these people are busy, so therefore let's just let them work on this thing. Meanwhile, something is just sitting there in one of these columns or in your to-do, you even if you have like to-do doing done, right? If it's just sitting in your doing column for days and days and days and you're just deferring it because it's either somebody's busy working on something else, 
Um, you don't want to collaborate on it. Everyone's working on their own things, things like that. So something is just sitting there. Um, essentially, what you're doing is you are actively incurring flow debt, and your cycle time, cycle times, are, and your predictability is going to be uh, suffer for that. Uh, and last but not least is focus on blockers. The longer something is blocked, the more flow debt you're incurring. If something is blocked, you and then you go work on something else, and you don't unblock that item, that is a bigger cause of flow debt than even something not being blocked. And the reason for that is because you have no idea when it's going to be unblocked if you don't actively try to unblock it, right? And so people will create a blocked co column. Um, worst case, they'll just ignore it. Second worst case is they'll create a block column, throw it over in that column, and just keep working on other things, right? That is not what you want to do. You want to aggressively unblock work whenever you can help it, right? And you want to focus on work item age. If you do those two things every single day, if you focus on work item age, trust me, you will uh, have a more predictable system and you will have a, a more consistent and better delivery, right? So that's what I wanted to focus on today. Focus on work item age, focus on blockers, Focus on scattered uh, cycle time as a picture. Focus on delivery as a picture and not a single number, okay? What does that picture tell us? Can we see where we're borrowing cycle time from one thing to another? And you can go and do an analysis if you use a tool like a cycle time scatter plot on. You know, these items that are over, over our SLE or over our 85th percentile, what happened with those? How long did they spend in each workflow state? Did we work on something else and prioritize it over this thing once it had started. Most, my, most likely that is the case. Most likely it's not that it's blocked, although of course it could be. So that's a tip. So how do you get started with this, right? Well, obviously I'm using a tool, uh, Actionable Agile uh, tool. Uh, um, full disclosure, I don't get anything for this tool. I don't work for the company. I just, I think it's a great tool. Um, uh, you can use this tool, of course. You can simply just talk about item age for your items. If you use a digital tool, there are kind of plugins and techniques for that. Every tool is different, but the point is talk about your work item age, track it every day. If you were to do this with a physical board, right, you can simply just put a sticky on it. You can write a number of the item age, right, right on the sticky note. You can, you can recreate this aging work in progress chart um, in a physical form, right? Just make a y-axis where you just every day you move the item vertically up. You can literally do the same thing. I have done techniques where I would put stickers. For, for example, if you're working on features like at a program level, and I did this in Safe, for example. Again, this is framework agnostic. So I'm, we're I'm trying to visualize the work in progress, the aging work in Safe using a program board. So across 10 different teams in, in, inside of an Agile release train. And we would put these stickers right on the physical um, on the physical stickies that represented item age. And in this case, it represented months that had started but not yet finished. You could use weeks, every two weeks, months, whatever the case is. For stories, I would use days, right, for example. And anyway, just the physical act of putting the sticker on the thing, having people do that you know, as it aged past another week or past another month, was enough to just keep driving the conversation home about hey, we should really be focusing on getting this stuff done before prioritizing this other work or starting this other work. Another way you can do it, um, if you just have a to-do doing done um, workflow, um, I also created a scrum board, which was like a, a physical one, which was a doing column, but three different versions. So there was doing less than three days, doing between three and six days, and then doing after six days. And so basically at the daily stand-up, teams would just, no, this is totally Scrum, for example. Teams would just, hey, it's been more than three days, this thing's in progress, right? Boom, we're gonna move it to the right side. Move it to the right now, it goes between three and six days, right? And so, again, any techniques which you wanna use to focus on work item age, that's all that's important, regardless of the tool, right? So that's what I wanted to talk about today. The number one thing, uh, killing delivery, is actually not what framework you use, what roles you use, what technology you use. Of course, technologies that come into play. Um, you know, our DevOps techniques to help our delivery, of course. Um, but, uh, and obviously things like testing and automated testing and all those things can help your delivery. But agnostic of all of those things, this, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't even matter if you're doing software development. This same principle applies no matter what, right? So. If you want to learn more about this, um, 
I'm, I'm going to give a shameless plug in a second. I'm going to give you the free plugs now, though. The free plug, if you go to ProCombine.org and go to ProCombine.org, I'll link it. If you go to the, um, there's a Kanban guide, but there's also a Kanban pocket guide. I highly suggest reading that. It's a totally free resource. It is excellent. It gets into this. And they actually say in the Kanban pocket guide. And when I say Kanban, I'm not talking about Kanban as a framework. So let's just stop there. Oh, well, we're not using Kanban. Therefore, this is important. No, I'm saying Kanban as a strategy to any framework. This is one of the core principles of that. It doesn't matter what framework you're using. This applies. And so they talk about the number one metric is aging work in progress. Okay, that's over everything else. If you focus on anything, focus on that because that will help your predictability and your ability to deliver. So go read that resource. It's totally free. Some other books you can read, um, Actionable Agile Metrics by Dan Bacanti. Uh, that's a great book to get started. There's another book I'm probably going to be doing a podcast on soon called Understanding Variation, The Key to Managing Chaos by Donald J. Wheeler. Um, I just finished it, so I'm going to be doing a po probably a podcast about it, but excellent book that talks about variability, talks about um, using uh, metrics as targets and why you shouldn't do that. Um, what, is, what does a predictable versus unpredictable system really look like? And so everything today I'm talking about is the kind of the foundation for that. Anyway, um, if you want to take a training about, if you want to do a much deeper dive on this, uh, I do, so shameless plug here, I do offer trainings. Um, and if you go to ProCombonTraining.com, you can see all of my classes, like, like applying professional Kanban as a strategy to any framework or by itself, like Scrum with flow metrics, like, like flow metrics with probabilistic forecasting. There's uh, an even scaled uh, how to do this at scale in a portfolio setting. So all of this stuff I train, um, and I'm not the only trainer, of course. If you go to ProCombine.org, you could see many other trainings there. But that's my shameless plug. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Um, if you're still here, I appreciate it. You could have done anything else with your time, but you listened to me ramble on um, about a, a work item age for a while. So thank you so much. Uh, see you next time.